Counting down from five, four, three. <laughs> It's Tuesday. That could mean only one thing. It means that you've showed up to the right place because it is time for Comic Book School Live. Comic Book School is the place where we talk about the craft and business of making comics. I make comics as a writer, and I am joined by a person who makes TV as a writer. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, buddy. Mike, we were we were color coordinated a minute ago as you were undressing in the background. You had a in the background. You had a gray. Sweatshirt on. What happened? I had a gray sweatshirt and uh, yeah, it got too hot. So I had to take it. <laughs> so we were color coordinated and now we're not. <laughs> well, I could put it back on if you really want me to, but no, I like, I got to tell you, looking at your rippling muscles and your bulging neck is <laughs> bringing out the superhero in you. And speaking of superheroes, Mike, you know, at Comic Book School Live, we do everything for free and kind of crappy, right? Well, kind of like it's, it's suited us well so far. Yeah, we're, we're kind of half-assed. But if you want a proper education, more than what we can possibly give you at comic book school, Mike, what might you want to do? Um, I might want to go and check out uh, the Joe Kubert School. You might want to check out the Joe Kubert School. Talk about <laughs> jumping right to the end of the story. <laughs> From the Joe Kubert School, please welcome Anthony Marquez. Anthony, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Mike and Buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me here. I just kind of wish Mike, you would have felt a little bit stronger to want to go. Not just a might. You just, you want to be there. You well, want to be there. Mike. You haven't seen my art, so if you saw that, <laughs> you'd be like, I don't want you there. It's all right. It's all right. Well, Anthony, you um, you did something that was, I don't know, very unexpected a couple of years ago. You announced that you had bought the Joe Kubert <laughs> School, which, like, I didn't know you could buy a school. And uh, since then, Mike's been trying to buy a church, so <laughs> pretty excited about it. Anthony, tell us, wh who are you and, uh, and, and what is your role at the Joe Kubert School? And then we'll get into what the Joe Kubert School is. Maybe we'll do that first. Anthony, what's the Joe Kubert School? So the Kubert School is a cartoon and graphic art school. We're located in Dover, New Jersey, and it was founded back in 1976 by Joe Kubert and his wife, Muriel. And it was started out of a need. A lot of people wanted to get into this field. And Buddy, I think, as you know from going to shows, a lot of times when you're there, people will come up to you and they have questions of, how do you break into the industry? And it's something that people are extremely fascinated by because so many people want to work in comics. I rather whether they want to be an artist, they want to be a writer, a colorist, a letterer, editors, the production people, they want to work in this industry. And it's a big, fun one to be a part of. And so that's what Joe started off by creating was the Kubert School. So this way people can come and learn those sort of things so that they can get jobs in this field and have really great professional careers. Wait, what year did he start this school? 1976. So we're approaching hmm. our 50th year. We're, we're getting wow. pretty close. Wow. I didn't yeah. remember back that far. They, yeah, we didn't even know there were comics back in 1970. <laughs> so, Anthony, before we get too far, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, what you do at the Joe Kubert School. Sure. But I wanted people to see, uh, I have to look over here as, uh, as I run everything all at once because Mike refuses to press any buttons. That's part of the deal. That's so, right. That's why, yeah, I, that's why I get paid so You much. are quite the accomplished artist as well. You have this wonderful, um, I guess, modern animated style. Uh, how would you describe your style? 
Well, that's a cool question. Uh, fun. I like to think it's fun. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody's a little beefy, you know, across <laughs> across the board. You know, maybe it's because I like to eat food. So, you know, I, I like to think that everybody does, you know. Uh, but no, I like a big old fun style. I like high energy, uh, dynamic. Action. I think I, I think I first discovered you. I made uh, the connection to you through a uh, mutual friend, Mike Martz. I love Martz. Yeah, we all love Martz. Yeah. Who doesn't love Martz? Who doesn't love Martz? It's like not loving Mike Fasolo. <laughs> Who doesn't love Fasolo? <laughs> and then Anthony, I, I saw this red Sonia, and I was I, I thought this guy is uh, really a talent to watch. And as usual, I was right. You are a talent to watch. Ah, you're nice. Um, Don't say such nice things. <laughs> I say these things with all sincerity. Um, you know, I follow you on all the socials uh, where you share your artwork here, uh, such as this on Instagram. What are we looking at here, Anthony? So currently I'm working on a series called Batman The Audio Adventures. And so we've been working on this. It's a little bit over a year and a half now. And it started off, it's actually a really great audio show that's written by Dennis McNicholas, uh, who is the writer and director for the show that's on HBO Max. And it originated off with me just doing designs for the show. So if you go on HBO Max, you can see all the character designs that I did. And it, these that has the, the um, I guess the key art or whatever you want to call it, uh, the title card art for when you log in to listen to it. And then that kind of grew into a thing after it became really popular and they wanted to launch a comic book series. So what you have here is a page. This is uh, one of the later issues. I'd say maybe issue three or four. And I have the privilege of working with Jay Bone, who's an incredible artist as well. And he's been inking uh, my work as well as splitting some of the issues with me. And then uh, just Dave Stewart on colors, who's absolutely incredible. And Dennis is writing the series as well. And editors are fantastic. The letterer is incredible. Everybody involved has just been fantastic to work with. It's been a real privilege to be a part of. Mike, we, get, we, we could follow the story and we don't even we don't even need words, right? Yeah. He, this guy's he, happening. This guy's pretty good, huh? He shot him with a with a slingshot, though. That's not going to stop Batman. It was great because in the script, um, <laughs> it's very funny because he's fighting these uh, the Burma Shave kids, Burma Shave boys, and they come up to him and uh, they attack him. And in the script, it called for him to beat the crap out of these kids. And I was like, I don't know how to do that without it either becoming too hilarious. Or uh, just a little bit too violent for Batman to do against a bunch of kids. So I just kind of wanted to do very quick sort of takes where it's ended very, very quickly. And they're all just kind of knocked down on their butts. You mean nothing. the script didn't say beat the shaving cream out of your hair? <laughs> you know, I wish I would have thought about that. That would have been great. You could you that. could use that. Now, there you, you, uh, you got... Um... You got some uh, work in progress showing how the comics oh, yeah. are made. What are we looking at here, Anthony? You're looking at a, a very low energy artist because that cup of coffee is way too low <laughs> right there. But I know, so when I get a script, this is what, you know, buddy, you're super aware of it, Mike, from writing all the scripts and whatnot. Um, we get it. And as artists, we have to go through and break everything down and make sure that the the pacing is right and that the, the storytelling is very clear. So what you see is a script with a bunch of my notes all over the place. And that's really how it goes down. You know, there's a little, probably a little bit of staging for this picture in that perfectly placed pencil. But uh, I would say that that is exactly how I break down uh, a page to start off with. So I do all my little loose roughs at that point or thumbnails right there on the script. And then I'll move that into a slightly larger rough. And then I blow that up. And then I light box those through and do my finished pencil pages. Now, would you like working with me, Anthony, because I leave a lot of white space for the <laughs> artists to draw on that. And <laughs> particularly for Batman and or DC Comics, you'd like to make that recommendation that I write a script for you. Hey, look, I'll, leave white space. I'll throw that in there. It's cool. I think you should. I don't I don't want you to feel any pressure. <laughs> um, but this is actually uh, this is also, uh, I think, going to what you had said, showing how you go now full up. Tell us what we're looking at in these two shots. So let's see. So if you take a look there, the one on the right and actually the one on the left over on the top left portion of it, uh, you can see like these photocopies. And then, so what I do is I take those little drawings and then I actually blow them up to 11 by 17. 
Uh, I already have them sized off. You can see the borders that are around them. So this way I have the live area and bleed areas all sized out. Uh, then I print that. Then because I'm a crazy person, I'll take a piece of tracing paper, slap that on top of it, refine that drawing probably a little bit more. And then I will light box that through onto the Bristol. So then this way I can get a really nice drawing. So I actually, I really draw a page probably like three, three times or more before it actually goes to the final page. Wow. Yeah. That is, I didn't realize that you put, you had that many stages to the art. Is that something that you learned when you attended the Joe Kubert School of yeah. Art Design? So that I learned it really from Adam when I was there. Uh, Adam was my instructor in first year. Then we had Andy in second and Joe in third. And I mean, Joe could just sit down and draw a page. He was incredible. I mean, if you ever got a chance, he didn't just whatever Joe, Joe knew exactly what he was doing. He was brilliant, but he had a whole process too. You know, he'd put down his thumbnails as he would do it, do his little roughs. And then he, he was good to go, but he was just brilliant. And it was amazing to watch. You know, we would, we would all love to bring our roughs up to Joe because it was almost like magic every single time he touched a page and he put it down and just worked over it. It was, it was, it was wild. I but I learned you this. Put a, lot of, from, you put a lot of, a lot of work into some of these uh, sketches though. You know, like you're really, you're, you're making sure the vision is where you need it to be. And I thought what, what you posted here was really generous to uh, your followers, which is, it shows it just doesn't perfectly come out of the pencil in the first swipe. Like you really work at it. Yeah. I mean, it's tiring. I always tell our students that too, though, is in order to be an artist or a writer or anybody in a creative field, the number one thing that you have to do is use your brain. You got to be willing to put in the mental gymnastics every single day. You know, it's mentally exhausting. When you get to the end of the day, you're going to be very, very tired. Drawing comics or working, like I said, in anything creative, is difficult to do. You got to put in the work. Um, it's, you know, in order to get things to look the way that you truly envision them to look, you, you got to put in that effort. And so right there, um, I mean, you could see I was, so this is probably this. So remember how I was saying I do that, the original rough, and then I put it on the tracing paper and I yep. kind of work it over more. This is the, on the tracing paper at this point, and I'm working it over even more. This is if you went back to that previous uh, slide, um, that drawing on the right where you see him kind of flying in kicking, mm -hmm. that's the same exact image. So you can see right there how rough that was, that initial sort of pose. But I just kind of wanted to get that energy in action. And then I come back in and refine it wow. and get all the actual anatomy worked out, the, the, the figure work. Like you can see the shoulder underneath the cape there even. You know, I'm trying to make sure that everything makes sense mike this seems like a lot of work that's it? a lot of work and it's, it's like a lot of work to to get through i mean i'm looking at how do you how do you differentiate like the orange and the red and the, the blue yeah. so for me like when i look at this the orange and the red are kind of and i don't i don't always do this for every single drawing a lot of times i'll just use a regular pencil and then kind of just re keep on reworking until i find what i like in there um but like with this, you know, my more defined lines are the dark lines. You'll see that blue on top of it. So those are the ones I know I really want to roll with. And then anything kind of not tightened up, like the cape, I had a good gist of what I wanted to do to keep the energy moving, to keep the flow, the direction uh, of the storytelling. So this will be you know, the direction that Batman's going in. But everything else is all there that I need. So I'm pretty much ready to go. Like even like where the hand is, you can see that that's not ultra uh, refined. Yeah. That went on his chest because I know when I go in there, I'm going to play around with the fingers a little bit more. I want to get a little bit more of a sense of, uh, uh, dexterity with the, with the hand. So Mike, I, I'm going to tell you a funny, true story. Um, so number one, Anthony, you, you are indeed a graduate of the school. Mm -hmm. And when did you go there? I went in 2008 to 2011. So truth be told, Anthony, tell the truth. When you were sitting in there going to school, were you looking around and going, one day I'm going to buy this place? <laughs> so, the, the crazy part of it all is that um, I love the school. I love the school back then just as much as I love it now. It, everything great that's happened in my life has happened because of that school. Um, wow. I got engaged when I was at the school. I got married when I was at the school. Uh, I got you know my first jobs while I was at the school. I made lifelong friends at the school. 
incredible place. It changes your entire life when you go. It's not, I'm not saying it because of, you know, I'm president of the school or it's like, no, it, it's a really, it's very unique. It's very, very special place. And if, when you go through it, if you talk with any of our alumni and there's tons of them, uh, they'll tell you it, it's extremely unique. And when you get finished with it, uh, you're better overall because of it. And so uh, I love the place. But yeah, when I was there, um, I knew I wanted to teach at the school someday. You know, that was always something. I know I wanted to teach there. And of course, you kind of always joke around, oh, well, maybe, maybe somehow, maybe some sort of magic <laughs> will happen and I'll wind up maybe in some sort of a, uh, a role in the office and kind of oversee some things and, and direct it. But I never thought that, you know, we would wind up owning it someday. Yeah, Mike, did you, when you went to college, did you ever think, I'm going to own this place? I, I did not, because I would not want to buy my college. I <laughs> <laughs> so I got a little surprise, Anthony. I don't know if you, if I ever told you this. I'm sure, I'm sure I didn't. Um, do you know what this is? Of course. That's probably, you got it upside down. Come on now, flip that around there. One more, one more. <laughs> well, I, I'm doing there it on go. camera. There, there we you go. go. That is, is an, the, that is probably a uh, brochure in there. This was uh, this was if you can draw a cubby. Um, yeah, right. I, I did that in sixth grade, by the way, to draw a cubby. To draw a cubby, did you? Yeah. Well, I realized, so I I, um, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And you can see here, uh, this is around... Oh, 1993, 94. 1993, 94. I'm sure that the the uh, the tuition hasn't gone up at all. <laughs> yeah, what was it back then? Annual tuition was um, seven thousand six hundred dollars. Six hundred one now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's incredible. And then here is the form, the application. I didn't fill it out. I was seriously uh, considering the Joe Hubert School, um, but I I I will tell you I um. I was exhausted after drawing a couple pages of comics. And honestly, that was what made me think I'd rather be a word person <laughs> because nouns and verbs are so much easier. Like Batman flies in through the window crashes, <laughs> and you've redrawn that three times. And I'm like, I was done already. I was like, <laughs> I was taking a nap. So I did, <laughs> at some, I did at some point, Anthony, uh, think about attending the Joe Kubert school um, uh, I would say my art was, um, probably better than yours. Like in, in all, <laughs> I would in all honesty, so. probably like at least as good as Joe Cooper himself, <laughs> but I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to do the work. It was too much effort. No. I, couldn't even, I couldn't even complete a page, Anthony. It took me, I was like, uh, uh, I got, I want to go, I want to, I want to go do something else. <laughs> it's funny. My mom sent me a. It was, we were just talking about from a center picture. I'm going to see. This is so lame that I'm doing this right now. I apologize. But um, my mom and I talk every single day. We always see what's going on in the world and whatnot. And so I had sent her this little photo of a, let's see if we can see. This is my son actually working at the school uh, at the desk um, drawing. So he he's always working. He's seven years old. He loves you drawing. Think, you I think, think that's I fair that the that the Marquez family has to depend on a child. <laughs> they, it's amazing how fast they work. But well, he, um, buddy, he bought a school. I mean, <laughs> you know, somebody's got to pay. He bought a My school mom, and like he's like immediately put the children to work. <laughs> <laughs> and Ma, here's another photo of your other grandchild sweeping the floor <laughs> and the other. But my mom sent me this picture, and I thought it was very sweet. She keeps it in this. Uh, little uh, picture frame. And these were actually pages that I was doing for my portfolio when I was trying to apply to the Qbert school. So that that's a, a younger Anthony uh, working at the desk. That's so, just uh, another photo of your son. That's, the same that's just Lee. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I thought that was, and I thought it was very sweet. I love that she put it in the little inspire. Uh, um, can't even think of the word right now. Frame. frame. Uh, it was very sweet. So. Well, I, I, I have to tell you, I, I did go to the Kubert School. One of the things that, that I want to note, and then we'll get into the Kubert School yeah. portion of this, is did you know that um, that I did this? Uh, no, that's not going to do. i got to go present. i got to <laughs> share a window, a tab, Adam Kubert. So you can see this. Look at this. This is... 
Well, uh, I mean, movies pay a heavy influence on on the work that I do. In fact, with this we Weapon X story, um, it was described to me that, that the that the world that you were prepared place in Shut is a completely up. different. <laughs> the world is a character unto yeah, here itself. You go. This is in the industry school. It was named after comic book legend Joe Kubert. As we all know, his two sons, this is Adam 1995. and Andy, Wolverine and X-Men. This is wonderful. You got to send me the link to this. Did you, did you, were you even born in 1995? Was I? Yeah. Yes, I, I was. I, I was, was talking like, to Mike. I was talking <laughs> to Mike. No. 96, I was born. Yeah, 96, anyway, yeah, we went to one the, year. We went to the Kubert School after I realized I would never attend. So, but we did. We went there with the early version of this show, Anthony, which was called Comics Vision, and uh, we put that on uh, on YouTube. So we got to in, we walked around the school, did the whole works, oh, and they really cool. they they offered me if I wanted to buy the school at that point yeah. in '95. I was like, "What am I going to do with the school?" They, they the didn't table. offer you a job as table. an artist, though. <laughs> no, they know I never <laughs> turned the work in. But they were like, we've been trying to sell this school. <laughs> we cannot find anyone. Okay, so Anthony, let's just keep going on. Uh, this is the Joe Kubert School located yeah. in what looks to be sunny downtown Dover. Is that right? I just took, took a wild guess. It is. That is, uh, I can tell because of the flowers, that is probably around October. Figures that an artist would notice that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh Every I like decorating the school. I like having it, you know, being a, a pretty place. So we always get the flowers depending on the time of the year. Like right now, we just put out some <laughs> new uh, springtime flowers. We always keep the grass cut, mulched, uh, new bushes, all sorts of different things. And we love making sure that that sign up front is nice and clean for people. To it see is a good look. It is a good looking uh, school. I, I've been there a few times. And we've and done a lot of improvements to the school, too, uh, since we took over. And no, Anthony, how, how, does, how does one like broach the subject of like wanting you know buy a school do you like take your wall out and go <laughs> <laughs> what do you say i wish i, wish I could place. say that that was the case but it's really not you know it was a lot of hard work to be quite honest it was a lot of really difficult work um to kind of bring that all to fruition but it was something that came up um you know, we had all discussed, you know, I'm really good friends with everyone on that side of the on, of their family. And it was a really serious conversation. And it's something that I had to bring up with my wife and we had to discuss that and kind of go over everything. And, you know, my wife, Jackie, is uh, awesome. You know, the fact that she didn't kick me out of the house the moment I brought it up. <laughs> well, uh, and and I, I would like to just add that uh, not long before that in your lifespan, your wonderful wife, Jackie, also let you buy a comic book store. Yeah. So like you were like, when you, she had to like take the credit card away from you, and you're like, oh, I said, I want to buy an airline. You know? No, it's you know, but it's all stuff that the thing is, is um, I don't know. The, I guess the best way that I can do it is we both support each other 110. percent I guess 100 percent really isn't enough in anything that anybody does in life, and you got to give it that extra 10 and even more than that. So we are constantly working. I mean, that that's all we do, but it's all stuff that we believe in and it's stuff that I, I'm really very passionate about. So for me, it's not a joke at all. You know, I really get involved with this kind of stuff. I'm there every single day. I'm usually there Saturdays. I probably have to drive up on Sundays. I'm always right there. The, the store, unfortunately, during COVID was a really a tough time for Dewey's. You know, we used to be located in Madison. But because of COVID, it was very scary. There was nothing new coming out. So we had to move that business. We kind of circled all of our wagons, you know, and brought it over to the school. And you got to realize, too, when COVID hit, that was six months in from when we had first purchased the school. So that was in our first year. Oh, so wow. that was that was a very, very scary time. So, you know, nobody knew what was going to happen. But I, I'll never forget my wife leaned on over and she's like, we got this. And that's all I need to know. As long as I hear, hey, we got this, then bring it on. I could care less who you are, but we're going to win. So I'm ready so to you go. Moved, I know you took your comic shop, you closed the Madison location, you, you brought it into Kubert School, right? Yeah. So the Kubert School, so in addition to having the the comic shop, 
and, and the school, we also have the art store, the Kubert art store. And so the Kubert art store is a great resource for supplies. If you need any sort of brushes, paints, pens, pencils, you name it, it's in there. Bristol, all the different types of uh, paper that you want, pads, watercolor paper, et cetera. So that's located on premise as well. And so what we did is we created a big sort of shared space where one half of that is all the comic shop. So all of your latest titles, back issues, collectibles, toys, cards, et cetera, all over there. And on the other side, you have all those art supplies as well. So it's a really beautiful sort of marriage between the two different uh, businesses. You you really brought it together. I mean, you, you're, you're showing the students the complete continuum and making it real for them. Yeah, I mean, that's the other cool thing. And I'm sorry if I'm going off uh, on too many tangents here, uh, guys. But no, one of the other things, here. Tangent away. We got one all of the big well. things that I was really passionate about because I remember being a student was I wanted to bring in a lot more businesses that wanted to hire our students. So what mm -hmm. we actually created was it's called the Cuber School Art Agency. And that's another uh, aspect of the business that we, we came up with. And so now what we do is we create specialty comics for different uh, companies that reach out, different bands. We do a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, another big thing that we've done now is we, we worked with DC Comics to create the Milestone Initiative, and that was for underrepresented artists uh, that are out there in the world. And so we created that initiative with them, and that was very successful. So you'll notice a lot of people that are doing the Milestone books right now were part of that program that we worked with. Um, oh, boy, let's see what else. We have a bunch of folks that have started working at Dynamite Comics right now. I mean, we're, we're always pushing to try to make sure that we're bringing forth that next generation of new artists because that's what the Cuber School is and that's what we're known for and we want to keep that going. You know, one of the things I'd like to do, you showed some uh, some images from uh, the school, I think it was really cool. So let's uh, let's take a little tour here. Uh, you've got, sure. um, looks like you guys are set up here at a con. Yeah, so the, what the Cuber School does is we also have field trips every single year. And what we do is we set up a New York Comic Con or we go to Garden State Comic Fest and we offer different opportunities for our students to actually go and table and set up. So this way they get that real world experience of learning how to interact with the public and how to sell because we want them to learn how to sell. That's so key to get that sort of experience underneath your belt, especially as a student. Don't wait until you until you're in, you know, you're graduating to get out there and do it. Start in first year, get that experience. So we also have different events that we hold at the school. Yeah, and we have free comic book day coming up in May, May 6th to be exact. It's 10 a.m. Doors open up. Feel free to come on by the school, 37 Myrtle Ave, Dover, New Jersey. There you go. Got to get that plug in. And, uh, you know, what we do is we have over, we're probably going to approach 60 artists this year, which is incredible. Writers, artists, uh, buddy, we'd love to have you there. If you want to be there, please be. Um, so we bring in a lot of the students. So it's a really nice mix of professionals, students, and getting them that experience dealing with the public. I think you're right with this. You know, it's so many people um, don't get that valuable tabling experience because when you get a tabling experience, you spend a weekend, you see what works, you see what doesn't exactly. work, right? You know, and then you do it year after year, you start to go like, okay, what do I do that's commercial? The number one thing is you got to complete things because nobody will pay for your the idea that's up here. They'll pay for what's on the table right here. And you have to have yep. low, medium, high. You have to have something uh, this year for somebody who's seeing you for the first time. And then somebody who comes back next year says, you know, do you have anything new? If you don't have anything new, well, you're just going to lose them. So I think yep. this is a great experience to teach them how to table. And all these students are great. Uh, Trinity is in the third year. Uh, uh, then you got... Toriana Wilkinson, and we got Angela Concepcion and Sean Mendoza, and all those students are fantastic students. They all work extremely hard, and all of them are very accomplished already, I will say. Uh, so I'm proud of all, all of them. They're all graduating this year. They're all in the third year at this point. And so. they'll all be employable, right? They're extremely, honestly, the majority of them are actually working right now. Um, Sean Mendoza has done a lot of uh, commission work. He's doing a lot of good stuff. He's already set up a Garden State Comic Fest for this coming summer. Angela Concepcion's already published his own creator own books. So he actually did that in second year. Toriana's a, a letterer. She's lettered a bunch of stuff already. And, uh, we worked very closely with DC to actually do a new letterer initiative as well. And she was one of the finalists for that. It was her and another student, uh, Thomas Owens. 
and they did incredible work. And then Trinity does incredible storyboarding and just art in general. And she just published a new children's book uh, that got picked up. Uh, and uh, it's something, oh, I'm, I'm mad at myself for not remembering, remembering the title. I think it's I Don't Like Potatoes. And uh, But it was a really cute, beautiful book, and she did, did a fantastic job. So all four of these uh, crew right here are just absolutely exceptional. Mike, you got, your, you got your checkbook ready? You ready to hire some? I'm ready to join. I know. Look at this, Mike. Now we're gonna. I gotta send that for one of those pamphlets. I wish I had. Uh, I wish I had finished like the you know draw Covey experience. Uh, this is this is them. So this is that that lettering initiative that I was talking talking to you about just now. So we brought in all these different students that we have at the school. Uh, these it was optional. It wasn't mandatory for them to partake in it. And so we have our lettering instructor, Taylor Esposito, who uh, is an absolutely fantastic letter. He letters a majority of the books that are actually out there on the shelves. Just open it up and take a peek and you'll see his name in there. And uh, he was teaching the students uh, how to letter some pages and went over a bunch of different things with them. And he did a great job. And so you can see Angelo actually sitting there in the back row on the right hand side with the uh, salmon colored shirt. And uh, he, he was ready to go. So. Uh, that was a really, really cool thing that we were able to take part in with DC, and I really appreciate that very much from them. And now look at this, Mike. Doesn't this look way better than when you went to school? <laughs> yeah. Like I, I went to school and I was like, oh, what will the classrooms look like? And they were like, there'll be a chair and you'll <laughs> be there. What do you want to know? <laughs> so that room room up like, I, would, I would love to. Wouldn't you love to go here, Mike? Yeah, because it's definitely more of a personal experience, it seems like. Yeah. yeah, it is. You know, we right. have about Very. anywhere from 80 to 100 students in the building, you know, for our full time program. And so on the top left, you can see we have that is our media center. And these pictures are, were most likely taken during the summer, <laughs> right before the students come in and scuff up all the floors and whatnot. But you know what? That's a sign that works being done. So that's OK. And then the room on the right is actually our uh, that's actually our lunchroom and kind of hangout area for the students. And we use that also for when we have to do special events. At times, we have other rooms in the building too, like our orientation room for when we have guest speakers. But that room we actually set up, if you noticed before, that's the same room that had Taylor Esposito teaching the lettering uh, a special event for our students too. And now, and then there's this, which they have a skeleton, Mike. Oh yeah. Every, every good school has a skeleton. You need to have a cool skeleton. So that's right. Why do you have a skeleton here, Anthony? Because anatomy is important, buddy. You guys got to know your anatomy. You know, so many students say, well, I want to draw stylized. I want to draw cartoony. I want to draw manga. I want to do this and that. I don't want to have to draw mainstream. Well, I got news for you. Doesn't matter how you want to draw. You need to have a strong understanding of basic anatomy. Right. And so we have figure drawing class across all three years. And it's so very, very important for an artist to develop a true understanding of the human anatomy. And, you know, if you really break it down and get into it even more, uh, animals as well. So this is amazing. I mean, you know, this is, you know, while we talk about the craft and business of making comics at comic book school, it is very community based. One of the reasons I wanted you to join us was to show the difference between doing what what we often do here, which is just part of an ongoing continuing education. This is very formalized, this is structured. And I think what's really important about this is, you know, if you only go to learn what you want to learn, you're like, I only want to draw bunnies. Yeah. Eventually you'll draw amazing bunnies, but that's it. When it comes time to draw a unicorn, you're going to be like, oh, I don't, I, I can't do unicorns, but by forcing, students to do things that they're like, oh, I don't want to do this. They learn organically about yeah. other things that they will need to draw. You want to just talk a little bit about how you structure your education to give them that, uh, that stretch? Sure. So the way that our school is set up is it's three individual one-year programs. Okay. So in first year, you might have basic drawing and narrative art on Monday. Then you'll have figure drawing and you'll have inking. You'll have business, you'll have creative writing, et cetera, and so forth and so on. Uh, digital lettering, coloring. Uh, so you have 10 classes a week and it's a set curriculum and you have to take part in each of those classes. And sometimes you might get 
multiple pages of homework for each class. And people might be thinking, oh my goodness, two pages of homework or narrative or lettering in each class, you know, 10 classes for one month, that's 20 pages. Well, guess what? Let me let you on a little secret. Most comics are 20 pages long. And you know what the deadline usually is? About four to five weeks. So you're going to be working on that same exact deadline schedule. So what we're doing is our curriculum is set up to make you a pro, to get you to learn how to turn things on time, how to work with your deadlines, how to work with an editor. It, you know, a lot of the way that our instructors are working, they're working professionals themselves. So they're working underneath different uh, deadlines as well. So they're able to give you that real feedback. This isn't just somebody that kind of touches on this as a as a hobby. These, these are real working individuals that have years of experience that you can now pull from and ask questions and learn even more. When I was a student, I tried to soak it up like a sponge. I actually took the job. I was actually the security guard at the school. And I, I took that job on just so I could bother Joe every single day. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and you know what? I'll say this to him. I'll say this about him. He was super kind and always made himself available to any student that wanted to go in and see him and ask. And that's something that I do too. My door is always open. If anybody has any questions, anything that they need help with, anybody can come see me or I'll direct them to somebody else that might be even better than, than I am at something. So this way they can get the right answer. But um, everything is built to turn you into a professional at our school. Yeah, and I think you, you know, you really structure it from, um, if I remember correctly, you know, giving them that exposure, giving them the basics, and then building up to higher and higher levels, but 100%. then having connections to traditionally DC, but of course, I met you, you were working for Dynamite Comics, so Dynamite Comics as well, helping them to get that invaluable professional experience oh, yeah. working with real working editors on a deadline, right? So what we do as well, in addition to just, you know, having them do all the work is we bring in about anywhere from 10 to 15 different companies in the, in the third year. So this way they come in, they actually meet with all of our students. And I got to tell you, the majority of our students actually start working while they're in the program. So let's say if you leave first year, you know, I always try to say, hey, look, see it all the way through if you're going to do it, because the payoff is worth it at the end. But a lot of those students actually start working in first year and then they kind of carry on into second year and then they go into third and they're already doing a bunch of stuff like I was just talking about with some of those individuals we were talking about before. Uh, but we bring in those 10 to 15 different companies and, you know, you have your DC, you have Marvel, you have Dynamite, you've got American Mythology, you have IDW. And we bring in some of those folks in person as well. So this way you can have guest speaker, and we open that up to our first and second years as well. So this way they can get some feedback. They can learn a little bit more. Uh, even guest speakers in general, you know, Andy uh, Kubert is, is a really good friend of mine and he still comes out and he'll talk with all the students, do portfolio reviews, uh, you know, and, and that's just, it's always a great day and we really appreciate it. But we do everything that we can to give the students as many opportunities as possible to get hired, even in second year. I shouldn't admit this, but I start handing out the formats of all the emails at all the companies. So this way they start reaching out, start getting those contacts, start building the relationships. I think that's the most important thing in our industry is you got to be able to build a relationship. You have to communicate. And if you can do that, you can, you can be pretty successful. Mike, do you remember when you graduated college? Did anybody help you with anything? Not at all. They were like, you're done. Get out. We need, we need room for the next group. <laughs> and then we have a job placement coordinator at the school. So this way, even after you graduate, they still continue to reach out and send a bunch of different jobs they could send our way. We're always looking to try to help the students. That's the number one thing for me is to help the students because I was on that side. I know what it was like to leave school the next day and then all of a sudden have such a structured three years of like, oh my goodness, it's quiet the next day. What do I do with my time? Uh, but... We work very hard with that, and it's something I'm very proud of uh, to see how it's kind of worked out. And you should be, because you're carrying on a tradition that that is been going on for decades. And um, students can also participate in other things. I think you can uh, tell us what you got here. Sure. So that's our summer sketch camp with a wonderful drawing by one of our instructors, Nick Capone. He's also a brilliant colorist, does a lot of work uh, in the industry as well. 
uh, it's done stuff for uh, uh, Dynamite and um, done different things for his own creator owned books. So he's just a brilliant artist in his own right. Uh, but this is our summer sketch camp and that's kicking off this July, as you can see right there. And that is for younger individuals and we actually go all the way through high school. So this is a, a really great program and you can do that weekly or you can do that for the month. So I would highly recommend looking into that for our younger artists that are looking for a way to kind of learn from professionals uh, to pick their brains and play with your own imagination. Mike, wh where was this stuff when we were growing up? Yeah, I think I think we should apply and then see what Anthony says about our drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. That would be great. <laughs> I'm bringing I'm bringing these rates in with me though, Anthony. I expect that's all right. That's okay. All right. Hey, you know what? You still have it on paper. It was sent to you. I think I got to honor that. You got to honor the ninety three ninety four school calendar <laughs> schedule. All right, Anthony. This is the time of the show uh, where we ask you, uh, as a creator, uh, what is one piece of advice that you wish you had received earlier in your career. You know, that's, um, I guess, you know, that's such a good question. Even when we were, we, you had told me about that one before. And that's a hard one to think about because it's, you know, what's one piece of advice that I wish I had gotten? And I guess it's just not to worry as much. Don't worry about being, you know, it's like, don't worry. It just kind of works out. Like if you just keep pushing and chugging along, um, don't push to be so perfect with your pages. You know, I think that that's something that, especially as a young artist, you're so hyper-focused on the, the idea of making everything perfect. It needs to be perfect. And just kind of realizing that that's not possible. You know, sometimes good enough is great. You know, that be okay with good enough. That That's really, really important. And I think that as you do that and the more you draw, the more of you will be seen then in those pages and you'll become a better artist because of it. So just focus on not worrying as much, do your best job and focus on getting better with the next page and the one after that and the one after that. That's not bad, huh, Mike? That's good advice. <laughs> That's so so sweet. Most of the time people said to me, you could do a little better. <laughs> Try a little harder next time. <laughs> I think I had the opposite problem, which is this done? They were like, I don't know, is that done? I was, oh. When I was younger, I was so over the top with just trying to make those pages perfect. I would draw. And then because of that, you know, I think this is, you know, we were talking about the style earlier on. Um, as a younger artist, I think you'll notice a lot of times if you do portfolio reviews, portfolio reviews, or you're looking at people's work, they have a tendency to over render the heck out of everything. And it's, it's an insecurity thing. You know, you feel the need to have to fill in every single little piece of artwork and try to prove that you're an artist, that you're, that you're a cartoonist, that you can do this sort of work. And that's not the case. Take a step back, you know, relax a little bit, have some fun. You know, it's a cool job. Yeah, well, one of the things I've noticed with your work is that you do so much with the fewest number of lines. It, it's a little bit like Alex Toth and some of those creators that come, come before you. Uh, where you do a lot with those, with a very few lines. And you can see how you work so hard to get that right line. Uh, but when you nail that line, it's one line that says a lot. Um, it's very sweet. Thank you very much. Um, it was actually, um, you know, before, I didn't always draw in this style. And it was actually Joe Rybant at Dynamite. Um, that he liked the way I had done some of these other drawings and he had seen them and they were a little bit simpler. And he said, hey, why don't you try doing that instead? And I was working on the shadow at the time. And I said, all right. You know, I kind of took a step back for a second. I was like, oh, you know, this will be fascinating. And if you kind of, if you're ever able to pick that up, I think it was like the shadow. God, I don't even remember what the heck it was. Just if you, you Google my name and the shadow, you'll find it. Uh, you can actually see how it really kind of started simplifying at that point. And then where we are to now, which is, it's, it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. And what you do so much of is, is put weight and depth with just a few lines. And I go back to Alex Toth, you know, there's a guy who does a lot with very few lines. And I think that you show that a lot in your work. And obviously as an artist, you're always growing. You have to, I mean, even, I think even, you know, 
we're doing Batman the Audio Adventures right now. If you and I think any artist, if you look at what a book looks like at issue one and you compare it by the time you get to issue six, it, it's different. It, there's going to be differences in it because you are constantly evolving as an artist. That's interesting. And Mike, do you think you're a better writer now than when you when you first started as a screenwriter? I would I would hope so. <laughs> I can't I can't guarantee it, but I would hope so. <laughs> But you know what you are good at, Mike? You are the best when it comes to trivia. And Anthony, we're going to ask you to um, to follow Mike's lead. Mike gives a bit of trivia and knowledge uh, to the audience, and then we try to figure out how we might integrate this into one of our stories. Mike, what do we have tonight? Ooh. We have tonight the uh, Gordon Lights in Arkansas. And these are these are a, a just a mystery set of lights that appear over these railroad tracks, and to this day, no one can understand why they don't. They they've had scientists out there to check them out, and they still honestly don't know what these are. Ooh. And the scientists are, bring like beakers and that like yeah. the Erlenmeyer flask and right, you know, the little the little Bunsen burners, things like that. They try to catch some of the light and put it in there really quick, but. <laughs> What do they stop. think it is, Mike? What, what is the, what's the prevailing thought of what the Gurdon light is? Uh, there are possibilities that it's some sort of gas, or another one is that this uh, area of Arkansas is settled over like a quartz deposit mm. that it somehow is, you know, streaming some of their quartz gases up into the air. They're not really sure. So Anthony, what would you what 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 would this turn into uh, as a story prompt? Do you think the Gurdon light? What 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 could we do with this? I liked what you were just saying about the crystals, and I like to think that there's like weird little gremlins that, <laughs> that are down in some sort of a cave, and they come out and you know get into a kid's house and cause a lot of problems. They drag the parents down in there, and the kids got to go get them, and they bring Nerf guns and have a great time battling them all. <laughs> You know, I think I, like I think there's a lot of fun with that. I mean, there's that's what's beautiful about just storytelling in general. Any idea has the possibilities to be fun and great and adventurous and what sad, you know, romantic. What it doesn't make a difference. You know, I mean, even with these lights, you know, maybe there's a lost princess that's been looking for her long lost love for a long time and she's been waiting at the center of it, you know. I don't know, and that's just kind of even rehashing kind of what i just played with because we stayed in the crystal realm you know but there's so many different things ghosts i mean that's a great ghostbuster story prompt right there there's all sorts of different things x files you want to make it spooky maybe you know you can do a <laughs> bunch of things that's why it's you know working at dynamite i had to deal with licensed characters all the time so you know you look for these sort of things that kind of throw off throw over to a writer like hey what do you think about this what about playing with something there Hey Mike, what would you what would you do with the Gurdon? What would you do with the Gurdon light, Mike? Um, I'm a big fan of uh, ghost stories as well mm. as time travel. Oh, cool! Um, they have they have their own you know uh, myths behind this, myths and legends about you know um, the ghost. But I would I would definitely turn it into some sort of ghost story that someone or something is there looking for. Could be like an old miner looking for that crystal mine. He's still there searching and searching. Comes back all the time. Never seem to find it though. I like that, Mike. I, I and you know me. I always go to crime. This would be uh, a, a, a trio of criminals would uh, plan a heist <laughs> around the fact that the Gurdon light would have all of the attention of the police department as people cluster around to see the Gurdon light. They would figure, well, now is a good opportunity for us to go do our heist. Do something so, else. Yeah, it's cover cool. for the heist. So that's that's what I uh, that's what I would do, Mike. Okay, that's, that's pretty that. good. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, so I, I will tell you real quick, just as a side note. Um, speaking of, uh, if you guys haven't yet seen Cocaine Bear, <laughs> the title Cocaine Bear makes you laugh. You will love Cocaine Bear, <laughs> or you won't. I watched it the other day, buddy. <laughs> It was everything it, it set out to be. It's it's like uh, what is it? Uh, what bear is it? Sharknado, and cocaine, right? It's like Sharknado. Yeah. Yep. It's it's what it advertised. You know, I I wanted more of the cocaine bear. 
Yeah, I watched it. That was my pro- that was kind of the my issue with it. I watched it and I was like, what am I watching right now? I was like, I wanted more piranha 3D than I think cocaine bear, if that makes yeah. sense. You didn't need all the people involved. You needed the yeah. bear and the cocaine and attacking, and that was it. Yeah, I wanted to see more just I felt like it was almost I'm trying to word this in the right way. It's not that it took itself seriously. I don't think it was too over like right there, but you know, like Piranha 3D, it just seemed like everybody had, was having the best time making that movie. This movie just felt like, wow, they really don't know how to make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> what I like is that they didn't blink when it came to the gore. They gave it all to you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I was like, seen the cocaine bear yet? I haven't seen it yet, but I mean, I've seen the trailers and I'm definitely interested. It is. Uh, I think it's I think it's a masterwork. <laughs> I think it is high art that should be hung in the Louvre. It's better than Casablanca. Yes. It is clo- it's pretty close. Clearly. It is pretty close. Anthony, oh, it looks like we got comments. It looks like people woke up here. Here you go. Cocaine Bear, The Revenge. <laughs> From Fernando, who has been teaching at the school since, what, the 1920s? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He precedes Joe Kubert. I think he was there. Yeah, was he just was actually a, the first instructor at the school ever. He's been there for a long time. And, uh, and then let's see what it, Glenn Gatilla says. It should have been just a slasher. Bear eats Coke and kills. I, I, I agree, Glenn. Isn't that what it was? It's pretty much it. <laughs> it's pretty much it. But I think Fernando's already pitching Cocaine Bear too. I, I want to try to incorporate those crystals and the, the lights in Arkansas. Right? There you go. It's I, all yours. It's, it's, <laughs> it's all you, man. You just incorporated the burden. You're so light. giving. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah. So, hey, Anthony. So um, I'm sure that all of your students here know the routine. Like, comment, and subscribe. Follow Anthony in all the places. Uh, check out the Joe Kubert School and... Uh, We will see you next Tuesday for more Comic Book School Live. Don't go away, gang.